So today we are going to be covering synchronous generators. So let's start by talking about what they are and how they work. So I'm going to draw a picture here. I'm going to do my best um, to show you what this is, but we are going to have a stator. on the outside like so. And much like we saw with our induction machine, this is going to be a three phase system. Uh, so we're gonna make things easy and look at three phase, two pole. So if this is our A, down here will be our A prime. 120 degrees out of phase with A should be B. Directly across should be B prime. 120 degrees out of phase with B will be C. And directly across will be C prime. So these represent our phase windings and this whole structure here is our stator which is very often called the armature when we're dealing with synchronous machines okay so we are also going to have a rotor and our rotor is going to be pretty significantly different than what we saw in our induction motor. So this is the physical structure of our rotor, also known as our field system. So in the very middle here, this is going to represent the shaft of our rotor. We're going to assume rotation in the counterclockwise direction and attach to our rotor are going to be field windings. These field windings are excited by a DC current IF field current through slip rings. And what happens is that when we have this DC current passing through our field windings, we are going to generate field poles. So we're going to have a North Pole and a South Pole. caused by our current IF. So a couple of things here to point out. The synchronous generator and also the synchronous motor, which is what we're going to talk about on Thursday, is a doubly excited system. So that means there is 
external excitation on the stator and excitation on the rotor. So in the induction motor, we had single excitation because we applied outside voltages to just the stator and then the rotor developed its own voltages, currents, and all of that kind of stuff through mutual induction. For a synchronous machine, regardless of whether or not it's a generator or a motor, we are supplying some external power to both the stator and the rotor. So we have a double excitation here. Um, another thing that is pretty darn different is that our rotor is an electromagnet, right? So if we have wires wrapped around our rotor, our rotor in this particular orientation and pass a DC current through them, our rotor will have an associated magnetic field or magnetic dipole moment uh, directed from south to north, which I've indicated here. And then as the rotor spins, that DC magnetic field will be our revolving magnetic field of our system. Okay. So what is going to happen as the stator spins? Okay, so we have some DC magnetic field oriented at this particular moment in time, directly up and uh, from direction down to up, right? And then it's that field is going to spin in the direction that I've indicated with omega. So what are the stator windings going to see? So in an induction machine, what did the rotor windings see when we had a rotating magnetic field? A changing flux. In this case, the rotor field is generating that revolving magnetic field and the stator windings are going to see a changing flux. So this is really very similar to the classical example of a loop in a static magnetic field and what happens when you rotate the loop. But in this case, the loop is staying constant or staying flat, and the field is the thing that's rotating around. But either way, we're going to have induced voltage, right? So what we should see is an induced voltage in the A windings. So it's going to be lowercase e because we're looking at an induced voltage. Um, subscript A, A prime. So this is specifically in the A windings as a function of time. And it will be whatever the maximum of that induced voltage is times the cosine of omega t. Similarly, in the B windings, we will have E max, sorry, cosine omega t minus 120 degrees. And in our C windings, E max cosine omega t minus 240 degrees volts, where the separation between, uh, the phase separation between our induced voltages is because of the physical 120 degree separation of our stator coils, right? So if the coils are 120 degrees out of phase, then the change in flux they see is going to be 120 degrees out of phase. And so the induced voltages across those coils will be 120 degrees out of phase. So now let's figure out what this peak voltage is going to be, okay? So our peak voltage Emax mathematically is going to be omega, the speed at which our shaft or rotor is rotating, times n, the number of turns in our stator windings, 
per phase times phi b, the flux that's passing through those stator windings. And so this is going to be the steady state flux through the air gap generated by our rotor. Our, our field windings would be a better way to put it. Okay. So this is how it works if we assume that our winding is in a single slot. But if we distribute our windings ab among multiple slots in our stators, which we saw in induction machines, we're going to have omega n times phi b times kw, where k sub w is the winding factor of the stator. Let me put that in here. And numerically, KW will always be slightly less than one. Finally, we can relate this to the frequency at which the rotor is spinning by simply saying that omega is equal to two pi f. So we'll have two pi f times n times phi b times kw, where I want to be specific here, n is the number of turns per phase in the stator windings. F is the linear rotational frequency of the rotor. And phi B is the magnetic flux in the air gap. generated by our field winding. So, from here we can see that the time varying voltage induced across the A phase of our windings is going to be 2 pi F N phi B KW cosine omega T volts, which has an RMS voltage of 2 pi over root 2. F and phi B KW with an angle of zero degrees. Our B phase induced voltage in the time domain is effectively the exact same thing except shifted by 120 degrees. And the C phase, as expected, will lag the B phase by 120 degrees.
sorry, I put the square root sign up top when it definitely should not have been there. All right, so these relationships tell us that our induced voltages here, the voltage that's provided by our generator, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, depend on three distinct things, okay? So the first thing that they depend on is the speed of rotation in terms of either omega or f, right? So the faster our rotor spins, the larger our induced voltage will be. The second thing that our induced voltage depends on is the flux generated by the field windings. Phi B, and the flux generated by our field windings is in turn dependent on the current that's passing through our field windings. Larger current gives us larger flux. Right. So this is going to be proportional to our field current IF. And then our last thing that our induced voltage is dependent on is the construction of the machine itself. So the number of turns in the windings, the winding factor, and also the number of poles, which isn't showing up here because we're only looking at a two-pole system. Um, but as we learned, looking at induction motors, our synchronous speed is dependent upon the number of poles for an induction motor, well, the synchronous speed for an induction motor and the synchronous speed for a synchronous motor represent literally the exact same thing. All right, so let's work an example. Do I need to go back to the last page that I changed too quickly? Sorry. You're rubbing your hand too early, Nick. We got like four more pages of notes. <laughs> I'm recording this, so I mean, that's of use, hopefully. Uh, just as a heads up, I did edit and post the videos and all that kind of stuff for all of our induction machine jazz and then i also uploaded another homework set that's due on saturday to give you guys plenty of time to go at it yes Nick. that is correct it's because i was really sleepy last night when i made the homework assignment out and i did not trust myself to work the problems correctly so i will update the assignment sheet with correct answers uh, here in the next day or so but i wanted to give you guys a heads up and a head start um, it's following the examples that we worked in class on last Thursday pretty well exactly until the very last part of the last problem, which is the calculation of efficiency. We did not calculate the efficiency of a motor under maximum um, slip, or excuse me, uh, maximum torque. Uh, that being said, the efficiency calculation will be the exact same thing as the efficiency calculation we worked in the previous problem except using the value of slip at maximum torque instead of just the regular slip. So while we didn't work it specifically, we worked something close enough that I feel very comfortable asking you guys to do it. So, uh, but I will get those answers to you guys as soon as I possibly can. And hopefully within a, 
a day or two prior to when it's due so that you have time to look at things and make any adjustments should you feel they're necessary. All right. So back to our example. We have a two pole, three phase synchronous generator. which has a rotating flux of phi B is equal to 51.6 milliwebers. The number of turns in each phase coil is n is equal to 20 turns. And the winding factor of each phase coil is KW equal to 0 0.96, so 96%. If the shaft speed is 3000 RPM, determine the magnitude of the RMS phase voltages of the generator. And we're looking here specifically for the induced voltages. So the magnitude of our induced voltage is going to be that quantity E max. Actually, it's going to be that quantity E max divided by the square root of two, right? Um, so let me write this better. The magnitude of E A will simply be E max over root two, which is one over root two times 2 pi f times n times phi b times kw. And throwing this at you guys really quickly, 2 pi f is simply the angular velocity omega. Okay. So the reason why I'm saying that is because we are given a rotational speed and RPM, and we are hopefully at this point pretty good at converting from a rotational speed and RPM to a rotational frequency in radians per second, right? We know what that simple conversion factor is. So N was given to us, phi B was given to us, K sub W was given to us. So the only thing that we need to figure out is what that angular frequency is or what that linear frequency is. So how did we do it or how do we do it? And it's the exact same way we did it last class. Speed and RPM, right? So omega of our rotor is going to be the speed of our rotor times what? Is a conversion factor. So we don't have slip or anything like that in a synchronous speed machine. And also we're not looking at a motor anyway. So this is literally just straight conversion of units effectively. Two pi over 60, thank you so much.
So this is how we convert from revolutions per minute to radians per second. Right. So that's 3000 RPM times two pi over 60 gives us an angular frequency of 100 pi radians per second, which is the same as 314 points. 159 radians per second if we want to do some rounding. From this, the magnitude of our RMS phase voltage is going to be 1 over the square root of 2 times 3.14, or excuse me, 314.159 radians per second times our 20 turns times our 51.6 millilebers of flux times our winding fraction uh, 0 0.96, which comes out to be 220.083 volts RMS. All right, so now let's look at our equivalent circuit. I believe we have a reasonable understanding of how the generator works. Our field winding generates some DC magnetic field. The rotation of our field windings causes a uh, the stator windings to see a changing magnetic flux, and then the voltage induced in that magnetic, uh, excuse me, induced by that changing magnetic flux is literally what we just calculated, right? So we have rotation causing the creation of voltages, which is exactly what a generator does. So now we're going to look at our equivalent circuit, okay? So I am just going to draw something here. And it is going to be pretty large because it's going to incorporate all three phases of our system. Okay. So on the left hand side, we are going to have our field circuit representing the rotor. And over here on the right hand side, we are going to have our armature circuit representing the state. Right, because we're dealing with a generator, effectively the field circuit or the rotor is the primary and the armature uh, or stator is the secondary here. Okay. So I'm going to start by drawing the stator circuits um, because there are three of them, so I want to make it sure it looks correct. So this is going to be for the A phase, and this is a phase to neutral equivalent circuit. So we are going to have some resistance RA, we'll talk about it in a moment, some reactance JXA, a second reactance JXAR. And then a set of terminals, right? Across this set of terminals will be a voltage, which I'm going to call V phi. So this is our phase voltage at the A phase. And so this is the true output of the generator, OK? So what we are going to see is that the voltage at the terminals of the generator aren't going to be quite the same as the induced voltage, okay? Uh, and we'll get into why that happens a little bit more in a moment. 
And I'm also going to include the possibility of us having some load connected here. We are gonna have two more of these circuits that are gonna be exactly identical to this, one for the B phase and one for the C phase. I'm sorry, what was the question? So the only thing that's going to have a B subscript is the induced voltage and the phase voltage. The resistances and reactances are going to be the exact same through each phase. So those subscript A's on the resistance is the armature resistance. Um, XA is the leakage reactance in the armature. And then XAR is due to a process called armature reaction. So effectively, the, the subscripts on the resistance and the inductances are, is going to be A and AR for all of the different phases, because they're going to be the exact same values for all of the different phases. I hope that was clear and also answered what you were asking. So these are our three different armature circuits, one representing the A phase windings, one representing the B phase windings, one representing the C phase windings. So on the opposite side here, we are going to have our rotor or field circuit. So I have the reactants of my field windings. And this is representing my rotating field coupling to those three stator circuits. I have the resistance of my field winding. And then I'm also going to have some adjustable resistance. And then on the left hand side, way over here, is my field voltage, which is a DC quantity. And so this current represents the field current. And I can go ahead and represent my armature currents, IA, IB. And I in their respective parts of my diagram. So this is the total three phase equivalent circuit for a synchronous generator. Now we're not going to use the three phase equivalent circuit. We're going to wind up simplifying it down to a single equivalent circuit on a per phase basis. Okay. Um, one thing that I do want to point out here is that because right now we're looking at how this machine works as a generator, 
the field winding part of everything or the, the field circuit really doesn't matter to us as long as we know how to calculate the induced voltage, which is exactly what we just figured out a few moments ago, right? So from here on out, I'm going to throw away that field circuit. We're just going to look at the armature or stator circuit, right? So in the armature circuit, RA represents the AC resistance of the armature windings. This value is approximately 1.6 times the DC resistance. Of the one. Does anybody know why there is a difference in AC resistance and DC resistance. You guys ever heard of anything called the skin effect? Skin, S-K-I-N. Okay. So when you have a current carrying conductor and you're passing a DC current, effectively all of the current spreads out evenly over the cross section of the conductor. In AC systems, we have the skin effect where the higher the frequency is, the more the current density is pushed out towards the edges of the conductor. So at approximately 100 kilohertz, you don't have hardly any current whatsoever flowing in the center of the conductor. Almost all of it is a surface current density around the outside. Well, 60 hertz is pretty slow. Right, so the skin effect is there, but it's not incredibly pronounced. So effectively, the resistance is about 1.6 times larger because the current is seeing slightly less cross-sectional area that it passes through, right? So if I were to draw, so let's say this is the conductor and the direction of our current is coming out we have a dc current all of the cross section carries some part of the current and for some AC current in the same direction. Instead, we would see that only a portion of the cross-sectional area carries current. And this distance is called the skin depth which varies as a function of frequency. Okay. So, because our stator is by definition carrying an AC current, we are gonna have some skin effects which is gonna cause our resistance to be slightly larger because not all of the cross-sectional area of our conductor is actually carrying current, right? And as we hopefully know, but I'm not sure if you guys have covered this, resistance is equal to electrical resistivity times length divided by cross-sectional area. So if the cross-sectional area is smaller, the resistance is larger. So that's what RA represents. XA
represents the self inductance. Of the state of line, right? So we have a coil, and we know that a coil of wire exhibits self inductance. So that's what XA takes into account. XAR represents the effects of armature reaction. Okay. So armature reaction is an interesting thing here. Okay. So we have induced a voltage in our stator windings. If we have something connected to our stator windings, our stator windings will then be carrying some current. What happens when we have a current carrying conductor? We have a magnetic field, right? So we are going to have a stator magnetic field and a rotor magnetic field, and they are going to be pointing in different directions. They interact with each other, and this interaction is what the armature reaction represents. So effectively, the magnetic field generated by the stator in response to the magnetic field generated by the rotor creates a little bit of distortion, doesn't cause any power losses, but it looks like a reactance. And so we represent it with some inductance X sub AR. Okay. Don't want to bore you guys with phase diagrams and all that kind of stuff when it's unimportant. Okay. So usually, XA and XAR can be lumped together to form a synchronous reactance. So our synchronous reactance is simply the sum of XA and XAR. And from this, we can get a simple per phase armature equivalent circuit. Which is going to be our induced voltage PA in series with some resistance RA in series with some reactant JXS. Here are the terminals of our generator. So here is V phi A. And then here is our load if there is one connected. So this is our per phase equivalent circuit for synchronous generator. This circuit, yes. Let me know when I can scroll back to the other stuff to you. And by the way, it's telling me to slow down. It's not going to hurt my feelings. My hand gets tired too. We good? Yes, yeah, no problem. I'm just making sure because there are lots of other people writing things down too. Yeah. Here's our per phase equivalent circuit. Let you guys finish copying this down before I go on another one of my rants.
and just notice that I'm missing my armature current IA, so I've got to have added that as well. All right, so this is a pretty straightforward equivalent circuit to put into practice because it's just a single loop circuit, nothing real wild or crazy here, okay? So if we want to find our voltage at the output terminals of our generator in terms of our induced voltage, what would we do, right? So we can say that the voltage V phi A is going to be E A, our induced voltage, minus our armature current multiplied by our armature impedance. So what does this equation imply? Our induced voltage is the overwhelming majority of the time going to be different than the voltage that we see at the terminals of our generator. In fact, the only time they will be the same is under a no load condition when effectively, yep, exactly right, I is equal to zero. So, four loads operating at a lagging power factor the magnitude of our terminal voltage will be less than the magnitude of our induced voltage. This is because it takes more field current to create flux in order to keep that terminal voltage constant, right? We don't want our terminal voltage to fluctuate because that's going to cause issues with whatever load we are powering, right? So the induced voltage has to compensate in order to keep that terminal voltage constant, and the induced voltage is going to make itself larger by drawing more current from the field lightings, okay? This situation is called over excitation. Four loads operating at a leading power factor will have the opposite. Sorry. Our terminal voltage magnitude will be greater than our induced voltage magnitude because we're operating at a smaller field current. This situation is called under excitation. And our last little bit here, the angle between EA and V phi A is called the power angle. or torque angle, and it's given 
the sine delta. So this is the angle of EA minus the angle of E phi A. Now for a generator, this angle doesn't really mean a whole heck of a lot. In a motor, this angle is critically important because the closer it is to 90 degrees, the more torque we're developing. Okay, we'll talk about that on next day. So let me I'll let you guys finish writing all this jazz down and then we'll work another example problem. Uh, lowercase delta. Gamma to me is this, that's lowercase gamma and that's uppercase gamma. Sorry, my Greek penmanship is terrible. All right. I'm sorry, what? Delta. Is that clear that it's lowercase delta? All right. All right. We're good to take a crack at an example problem so you guys can see some calculations and all that jazz. Okie dokie. All right. So let's say that we have a three phase sync, I can't spell synchronous generator is rated for thirteen point two kilovolts RMS. line to line and 50 excuse me megavolt amperes at a frequency of 60 hertz The generator has a leakage resistance of RA is equal to 0 0.15 ohms per phase. It has an armature reactance. of XAR is equal to 2.19 ohms per phase. And the leakage reactants is 0 0.137 times the armature reactants. If the generator is supplying a load at rated voltage and frequency, which operate. at a power factor 
of 0 0.8 lagging determine the following quantities. So I'm not going to give you guys like 14 things like last time, just four, okay? The synchronous reactants, X sub S, full load current, I sub A, specifically here I'm looking for the phaser representation, so I want that to be clear. The induced voltage E sub A, and lastly the power angle delta. All right, so our synchronous reactants is nothing more than the sum of our armature reactants, XAR, and our leakage reactants, X sub A, right? Because our leakage reactants is expressed as a fraction of the armature reactants, this is just going to be one plus whatever that fraction is times X sub AR. So in this case, that's going to be 1.137 times 2.19 ohms comes out to be. 2.49 ohms, all right? That part's fairly straightforward. Full load current. Here is where things are a little bit trickier, okay? So we need to figure out the current. What do we know? Right, so we know the resistances and the reactances, but if we scroll back here, uh, I scrolled too far. If we look at our equivalent circuit, in order to find that current, knowing the resistances and the reactances would require us to know both the induced voltage and the terminal voltage. And I would argue that we only know one of those things. We know or can figure out what our terminal voltage is because we're told that we're operating at rated voltage and we're told what rated voltage is on a line to line perspective. We're also told what the apparent power of our load is, right? So if we're operating at rated voltage, then we are drawing or we are supplying rated apparent power. 50 megavolt amperes. And I would argue that if we can figure out what our complex power is and we can figure out what our terminal voltage is, we can figure out what our current is using three phase power relationships. Does that make sense ish? So, what I'm suggesting is that for a three phase system, the complex power that is provided by our generator will be three times the voltage times the complex conjugate of the current because it has to be. So from here, 
we could say that our current is the complex power supplied by our generator divided by three times our terminal voltage conjugate. And I believe that we have been provided enough information to calculate the complex power that's being supplied by our generator, as well as the terminal voltage that our generator, right? So, the complex power that is being supplied by our generator is the apparent power with a phase angle that is the inverse cosine of the power factor at which our load is operating. You guys agree with that? Have you seen things like that before? All right. So what's our apparent power from the problem statement? Fifty megavolt amperes. All right. What's our power factor? Zero point eight. So if we throw this into our calculator, we're going to get fifty angle uh, thirty six point eight seven. Mega volt amperes. So what's our terminal voltage? So the 13.2 kilovolts RMS, let's assume a phase angle of zero. is a line-to-line -line voltage. Is our equivalent circuit and all that kind of stuff built using line-to-line -line voltages? No, it's built using line-to-neutral voltages, right? So how do we convert from a line-to-line -line voltage to a line-to-neutral voltage? What's the conversion factor in three phase systems for voltages? Square root of three. Now the question is, are we multiplying or are we dividing? So a line to line voltage is always gonna be larger than a line to neutral voltage. So I would argue that we're supposed to divide. Realistically, we're supposed to have a phase angle of 30 degrees come into here as well, but I'm just gonna assume that the angle of my phase voltage is zero degrees. Okay, so 13.2 divided by root three is I think seven point something, 7.621 angle zero degrees, kilovolts RMS. Putting these two pieces of information into our equation, IA is going to be the conjugate of S gen. So how do I take the complex conjugate of an imaginary number in polar form specifically? Wild guess. There's only a, so many things that we can do to a complex number, right? All right, I'm going to go to the next page here real quick. I'm going to wind up erasing this in a moment. But let's talk about what the complex conjugate operation means. Okay. So this is a complex plane. Here is our imaginary axis. Here is our real axis. Let's say that this represents complex number A, okay? 
So the projection onto the real axis is lowercase a. The projection onto the imaginary axis is lowercase b. So in rectangular form, this looks like a plus jb. We okay with that? There's an angle formed with the real axis. So we could also call this the magnitude of A angle theta A in polar form. We okay with that? The conjugate of A looks like this. So this is A conjugate. So in rectangular form, the real part is still lowercase a, but the imaginary part is now negative b. So the complex conjugate operation on a rectangular form complex number means we change the sign of the imaginary part. Okay. Well, this angle right here is a negative theta a. So to perform the complex conjugate operation on a polar form complex number, we simply change the sign on the angle, right? So rolling back up here, what's the complex conjugate of my complex power? 50 angle negative 36.870. Megavolt appears. And then we're going to have three times 7.621 angle. So, technically speaking, here, when I take the complex conjugate of a fraction, I need to take the complex conjugate of both the numerator and the denominator. So, this isn't going to make a lick of difference in the world, but I'm going to put negative zero to remind you guys that when I take the complex conjugate of a fraction, it's the conjugate of both the numerator and the denominator. And when I do this math, what I wind up getting is 2.187, angle negative 36.870 degrees, Kiloamps RMS. So that is my armature current in my A phase. For part C, I'm now trying to figure out what my induced voltage is, so I'm going to use. my equivalent circuit, right? So if we scroll up here, we were to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this loop, we'd find that our induced voltage is nothing more than the voltage drop over our inductance plus the voltage drop at our terminals, right? So that's gonna look like V phi A, which we already know, plus I A, which we already know, times R A plus J excess. So 7.621 angle zero degrees, kilovolts RMS plus 2.187 angle negative 36.870 degrees, kiloamps RMS. times 0 0.15 plus J 2.49 ohms. And this comes out to be 11.901 angle positive 20.457 degrees kilovolts RMS. So this is our induced line to neutral voltage or phase voltage.
in our generator. And then lastly, we want our power angle. So this is just the angle of EA minus the angle of V phi A or 20.457 degrees minus zero degrees is 20.457 degrees. Anything particularly wild or crazy here other than making you guys try to remember three phase power relationships that you learned a year ago. All right. So the last thing that I want to talk about today, this is an extraordinarily brief topic, is voltage regulation. Um, so let me erase my little diagram here because I don't have enough pages in my thing. So voltage regulation of a generator is simply quantifying that difference in voltage that we see between the induced voltage and the terminal voltage, right? So the voltage regulation of a synchronous generator at full load power factor and frequency is defined as V reg, this is going to be a fraction, the magnitude of our induced voltage minus the magnitude of our terminal voltage divided by the magnitude of our terminal voltage, and then usually expressed as a percentage. So we multiply by 100%. So as an example, let's simply calculate the voltage regulation of the generator. from the previous problem. So this is just straight plug and chuck, right? What was the magnitude of our induced voltage? Eleven point nine kilovolts, what was the magnitude of our terminal voltage? And we need to be comparing apples to apples here. So if um, E sub A was a line to neutral voltage, we need to be looking at the line to neutral voltage at the terminals. 7.6 something, right? 621. Multiply this by 100%. And our voltage regulation is 56.160%. So much like we saw with transformers, anytime we have an inductive load, we should see that our voltage regulation is a positive quantity. Anytime we are dealing with a capacitive load, our voltage regulation will be a negative quantity. Uh, that being said, in the transformers, we saw voltage regulations usually on the order of um, a few percent, and for generators, it's going to be significantly less depending on the size of the load and all that kind of stuff.
All right, that is enough out of me for today. So um, we're knocking off roughly 30 minutes early. Anybody got any questions before I go get a sandwich? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Yes, and, and that's because for an inductive load, we know that the magnitude of EA should be larger than the magnitude of the terminal voltages. And for a capacitive load, it should be the other way around. So the voltage regulation will have to be negative if the magnitude of EA is smaller than the terminal voltage. Yes. Uh, All righty. You guys have a good rest of your afternoon. Uh, I will try to get these answers to the homework set number five up as soon as I possibly can. I will also try to post a homework set on synchronous generators, two to three problems uh, in the next day or so as well. That'll be due one week from today. Yes. Um, I am very hopeful that I will get back your exam scores to you before the drop date on Friday. That being said, let me actually, I, I don't give a shit if I record this. Um, since this is my first time teaching the class, I am going to be, um, your exam scores might not be great, but I'm going to be rather generous with curving and things like that. So I would not worry about stuff too much. Like I'm not going to give everybody an A by any stretch of the imagination, but I understand that it's your first time seeing this. It's my first time teaching this. And so there are going to be fundamental disconnects and things like that. So I'm going to try not to be as much of a jerk as I usually am. So that's my goal.